My name is Shannon Rohan, and I am the Director of Responsible Investment Leadership at the Shareholder Association for Research and Education. We are very excited to be hosting this first webinar through the Foundation Investing 2.0 initiative. We're also really pleased that we have had such a high level of interest uh, from foundations who are joining us today uh, across the country. So before we get started, I just wanted to go through some housekeeping issues. Um, everyone will be in listen-only mode throughout the webinar. We have reserved the last 10 minutes uh, to take questions from the audience. Due to the large number of participants on the webinar, we ask that you submit your questions through the chat box fun function, which is located in the webinar panel on the bottom right-hand side of your screen. Uh, we encourage you to send questions throughout the presentations so that we can get uh, those in the queue. Um, and please also indicate if your question is directed to a specific speaker. Uh, if by any chance there are questions that we don't get to on this call, we will follow up after the webinar by email. The webinar is being recorded and will be provided by email to all registrants and will also be made available on the Foundation Investing 2.0 uh, webpage. Um, and so uh, we will send you that webpage uh, and provide that uh, at the end of the presentation. Uh, so I do want to hand it over at this point to Andrea Nemtem from Rally Assets uh, and she can introduce your, your herself and tell you a bit more about our Foundation Investing 2.0. Thanks Shannon. Hi everyone. It's nice to, um, to not hear you but know that you're all out there and, and Shannon it's great to hear you. Yeah, it's been really a pleasure working with Shannon and Cher on Foundation 2.0. It's a year-long partnership that is between the Philanthropic Foundations of Canada, Community Foundations of Canada, Canadian Environmental Grant Makers Network, and the Circle on Aboriginal Peoples, uh, Circle on Philanthropy and Aboriginal Peoples. And it's a, a series of workshops, webinars, panels, and master classes that these organizations have uh, partnered together to support and, and share and rally has been implementing it for their to be able to support their members on their learning journey around impact investing. At Rally Assets comes to this, we are uh, a full service impact investing firm. We work a lot with our clients in, in providing education, research strategy, uh, investment advisory, and with the OSC's uh, pending hopeful approval, uh, investment management. We created, we were sort of built from Purpose Capital, who has a long history in field building and education and research. And so this is part of our continuing commitment to the industry and building the field. Um, so today we're going to start, um, excuse me for one sec, the purpose of the webinar today uh, is to actually go through different ways foundations are addressing climate risk and investing in a low carbon future across different asset classes. We have three speakers who will talk specifically about their experiences and looking at ways to shift investment policies and practices in light of the climate crisis. We're gonna start with Shannon speaking to us about some of the risks posed by climate change. Uh, we'll take a very, I'll take you through a high level uh, overview of some of the things that investors are able to do with their investments. And then we'll have Rebecca Hurwitz from Clapwood Trust, Mark Gauthier from Concordia Foundation, and Joy Williams from Mantle 314 to share their experiences. Lastly, we'll have some time to open it up for questions and answers. And as Shannon said, please type in your questions uh, and we will get to them at the end of the hour. Shannon, maybe I'll hand it over to you to start us off. Great, thank you, Andrea. Um, we're also really excited to be a part uh, of the Foundation Investing 2.0 initiative. Um, for those of you not familiar with SHARE, we're a national nonprofit organization and we have offices in Vancouver uh, and Toronto. Um, and our mission is really to mobilize investor leadership for a sustainable, inclusive and productive economy. Uh, and we achieve that or strive to achieve that goal really by helping investors, including foundations, uh, vote their proxies, engage with companies uh, in which they invest and advocate for better capital market regulation. 
Um, and we also support and build leadership among institutional investors to help fil facilitate network building and peer learning. And, and this is really the work that we're doing uh, with Rally on, on Foundation Investing 2.0. Uh, so over the next few minutes, um, what I want to do uh, is really set the context uh, in terms of the climate crisis and what this means for investors. Uh, the title of this slide, you'll see here, The Climate Crisis, uh, The Race of, of Our Lives, is one I actually uh, borrowed from Jeremy Grantham, who is a money manager who is well known for his ability to predict investment bubbles, uh, including the tech crash in 2000 uh, and the financial crisis in 2008. And he has recently turned his attention to climate change and talks about the race of our lives uh, in the context of the Earth's rapidly warming temperatures uh, and our ability as human beings to respond to it. Um, but when I was preparing for this webinar, I was also really sensitive about setting the right tone uh, and not starting off with an entirely uh, doom and gloom picture that often leads us to shut down uh, and close off because it, it makes us fearful and it makes us sometimes feel helpless. Um, and so, uh, you know, I, I think we need to have our conversations and base those obviously in the data and the science, uh, but I also think we need to talk about the climate crisis in a way that can help us move forward. And so today we're going to spend a short time setting the context, but we are going to move quickly into looking at what some strategies are for foundations to consider. Uh, and then as Andrea said, we're going to hear from some of your peers and experts about steps they are taking. The good news is that foundations can be leaders in the space. I think we often underestimate the role that foundations and other uh, perhaps smaller investors can play uh, as catalysts for change. So uh, we can be pioneers, we can be influencers, uh, and we can build new narratives. Um, and, and we're not alone. As I said, there are other investors uh, in this space uh, who uh, are also starting to raise their voices, and, and I'm pleased we'll hear from uh, some of them later in the webinar. And so uh, just to sort of start off, I think it's important to note that the climate crisis is not one discrete risk factor or even a set of factors, but really a macro disruption across all industries and geographies. Uh, because the climate crisis is this macro level disrup disruptor, it really does uh, uh, require um, responses from investors that are both ambitious and bold uh, and perhaps also um, somewhat disruptive and that means uh, looking differently at the investment tools uh, and strategies that we've been using for the past 20 years uh, we probably need to look at uh, if those are fit for purpose for the next 20 years. Um, the image on the screen here is from the UN Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. It shows how much global temperature has changed since the Industrial Revolution uh, and how much of that is human-induced warming. Uh, so you'll see here uh, we have already experienced uh, approximately one degree uh, Celsius of warming uh, on average above pre-industrial levels. Um, and extraordinary weather events with significant financial and human con consequences are already increasing in frequency. Uh, the graph also shows that with the current trajectory, um, global temperatures will reach 1.5 degrees Celsius by around 2040. Uh, and so as you see the graph as it's moving along to the right, it's also showing some modeled pathways for future scenarios depending on our ability to get to net zero emissions. So this is you know, a graph I'm sure many of you have uh, already seen, but I think it provides sort of the big picture in terms of what we're looking at uh, in terms of observed global temperatures. Um, so what does this look like in Canada? Um, these graphics are from the recently released report, Canada's Changing Climate. Uh, the image on the left shows how much the annual temperature in Canada has changed between 1948 uh, and 2016. Uh, so Canada's annual average temperature over land has warmed by a best estimate of 1.7 degrees Celsius with higher temperature increases observed in the north, um, the prairies and northern British Columbia. Um, annual average temperature over northern Canada increased by 2.3 degrees Celsius since 1948 
eight, and that's really the greatest warming, uh, or the greatest uh, warming has occurred during the winter months. The image you see on the right are projected annual temperature changes under a low and high emission scenario. Um, and so I think really the key message to draw out here uh, is that both past and future warming in Canada has been on average about double the magnitude of, of global warning, warming. Uh, and as I said, uh, Northern Canada particularly has warmed and is projected to continue to warm at even more than, than double the global rate. Um, so the, the context in Canada is uh, warming even faster than at, global, uh, at the global level. So what does this mean for investors? And um, when we think about uh, the specific implications for investors, we often think about two broad categories of climate-related ri risks, uh, which will impact uh, investors' portfolio in the immediate, near, and long term. Uh, and the first category is really looking at physical risks. Um, the physical risks result from chronic and acute changes in climate patterns, including an increase uh, in the frequency and intensity of heat, uh, increases in droughts and hurricanes, uh, extreme rainfall, uh, and it is, of course, uh, about the 100-year floods occurring annually and the new forest season in the province where I am based uh, called the fire season. So these kinds of physical risks obviously can impact uh, across uh, your investment portfolio. They can impact real assets such as real estate and infrastructure, they can affect food and agriculture, they can affect mortgage portfolios, they can affect uh, supply chains and they can also drive movements of people and contribute to uh, public health crises. What you see here on the slide uh, on the right hand side are some disaster statistics that help put this into a global perspective. Um, the data is from a study that was conducted uh, on total disaster-related economic losses uh, and fatalities between 1998 and 2017. Uh, during this time, climate-related and geophysical disasters killed uh, 1.3 million people and left uh, further 4.4 billion people injured, homeless or displaced, or in need of emergency assistance and 91% of all disasters were caused by floods, storms, droughts, heat waves, and other extreme weather events. Um, we see uh, direct economic losses um, for disaster hit countries. Uh, those are valued at 2.9 trillion US dollars uh, and, and uh, the research um, noted that climate re related disasters uh, uh, were valued at 2.2 trillion US dollars. So looking at these physical risks, I think uh, it's important to go back and remember that the average expected warming in Canada has been and is projected to be double in the magnitude of global warming. So again, uh, these kinds of risks, these kinds of floods that we've been seeing uh, in uh, Ontario and Quebec this year, um, the ongoing fires uh, across Western Canada, these are things that uh, we'll likely be seeing more of. The second uh, category of climate-related risks um, for investors uh, are transition risks. Transition risks refer to the financial impacts that emerge as a result of the transition to a low carbon economy. Uh, and this includes the risks associated with stranded assets. So stranded assets are fossil fuel resources, um, primarily that at some point prior to the end of their economic life are no longer able to earn an economic return as a result of the changes associated with the transition to a low carbon economy. And there are multiple pathways to stranding. So uh, it could be regulatory stranding due to changes in policy, uh, economic stranding due to changes in relative costs and pricing, as well as technology uh, advancements and, and and changes in, in energy demand. And so, uh, you know, if we are to, and this is from uh, the Bank of England and some of Mark Carney's work, um, who has found that if we are to remain in line with the Paris Agreement, then approximately two thirds of the world's known fossil fuel re reserves could not be burned. Um, and obviously this has implications for the value of investments in sectors like oil and gas, uh, as well as coal. 
Um, and so uh, there are already examples of coal mines, coal and gas power plants and hydrocarbon reserves which have become stranded uh, by the low carbon transition. Uh, and obviously stranded assets are particularly worrying uh, for uh, the Canadian economy and capital markets. Um, and you'll see some data points there on the slide um, that uh, really speak to that in terms of the dependence of uh, the, our stock exchange and capital markets uh, on oil and gas in particular, um, and the value of fossil fuel companies uh, within Canadian capital markets. Um, and research shows, and I think another interesting aspect of this is um, the research has shown that much of the impact on future assets will come through weaker growth and lower asset returns across the board. So this really suggests that investors may not be able to avoid climate related risks by simply moving to, to other asset classes or sectors. That this is really something that will impact companies uh, across the board. It will impact companies in other sectors uh, such as manufacturing, transportation and high energy sectors uh, as well as sectors that um, use a lot of energy to make uh, raw materials um, or you know, like cement or, or steel, for example. So we're really looking at transition risks as uh, uh, something happening uh, at a macro scale across the, the economy. And then turning now, of course, away from the risks, the other side um, of that coin is really looking at the opportunities um, that emerge in a transition to a low carbon economy. And there will be significant opportunities in the context of the biggest shifts in the economy since the Industrial Revo Revolution. Um, the expected transition to a lower carbon economy uh, is estimated to require around 3.5 trillion uh, on average in energy investment per year for the foreseeable future. Uh, and this obviously generates new investment opportunities. Um, generation investment management um, actually calls this uh, the sustainability revolution uh, and I, I recommend a presentation uh, that's available on the generation website called sustainability trends report uh, and it outlines sort of a compendium of commercial opportunities paving the way to a sustainable economy and some of these opportunities are, are provided here on the slide so you're looking at renewable energy um, is increasingly uh, reliable and scalable um, but it's important to note that uh, renewables still remain a very small part of the overall global electricity mix um, we're seeing global investment in clean energy um, increasing from 50 billion in 2014 to 300 billion in 2017. We're seeing um, rapid improvements in energy storage capacity, um, as well as opportunities and innovations to reduce energy demand, which I think is really, really important. Um, electrification of vehicles is also um, moving rapidly with uh, approximately 4 million uh, electric vehicles on the road in 2018. So that's really the context piece. Uh, I went through that very quickly because I really did want to move uh, on to sort of the question of, okay, so what? Uh, what can we do about this? Uh, what are some investors doing? What are some opportunities? What are some practical next steps? Uh, and so I'm going to hand it uh, back over to Andrea uh, to take us uh, through some of that. Thanks, Shannon. Um, so I think that what we hear from, so we're going to actually talk a little bit about what kind of actions we can take. And I think from um, everything that you were saying, Shannon, that we can really see that the way we invest our capital not only has the potential to have a positive effect on addressing climate change, but it's actually essential. And this can feel easier said than done. So we can all say, of course, we want to shift our assets to be able to address climate change, but what do you actually do? What's the first step? So often one of the first steps is to actually set a baseline, to start by understanding the effects of your current portfolio. What is in your portfolio? What do you own? What's the carbon output? You can find out the weighted carbon average. How is it doing in the environmental met metrics of environmental, social and governance evaluation? What sectors are you invested in? Is it heavily weighted in fossil fuel or fossil fuel related investments? 
These are all questions that your financial advisor or consultant should be able to answer. If they can't, you might want to engage a consultant or firm or research such as MSCI or Sustainalytics. And you also might ask yourself if it's important to your organization that your advisors consider these issues in their investment decision-making process, that it might be important that they actually know the answers to these questions. And, and so, because if they don't actually have the information, then how can they take these issues into consideration when they're making their decisions on what they want you to own. Once you have a good picture, you can decide if it's actually good enough. So if you look at your portfolio, you can actually measure it against a benchmark of carbon output or weighted carbon average. You can measure it against a benchmark of how other, uh, how other portfolios are doing from an environmental perspective in terms of ESG metrics. And you can even look at it in terms of how is it doing in terms of revenue exposure uh, to, to issues around thematic themes around climate change? And if you feel that you can do better, which we can all always do better, um, then there's some really very tactical, easy steps that you can do. And you can, you can start to understand where you want to go. Um, the most, one of the most important things is to actually engage your current advisors and consultants. Often we're finding that, uh, that your portfolio manager at this time is actually thinking about this. Many of the investment managers and advisors and funds are trying to um, implement actually mitigation in terms of the portfolio value, in terms of how to address the pending issues around fossil fuel. Um, and others are looking in terms of reply, responding to their client demand for low carbon or fossil fuel free portfolios. What I found as an investor when I was at in Spirit, however, was that my portfolio manager would not offer these unless we directly asked for them. So even just having the conversation saying this is important to us as investors and we are looking at this in terms of your performance and our investments performance creates change in itself, opening up the questions. So once you have a baseline, then you can actually determine what are your targets for improvement. Um, strategies and opportunities in every asset class are available to invest in companies and funds that are helping to address climate change. You can invest in renewals, um, electric vehicles, energy efficiency. You may find that they're companies that you no longer want your want to be invested in. They may no longer no longer meet your parameters. They may be below your benchmark. They may be below your benchmark on carbon output, weighted carbon average. You may have decided to divest from fossil fuel. If you divest from fossil fuel, then you might want to actually have, you're going to have to actually reinvest those funds. It's been recommended by a number of organizations and investment professionals that rather than, and this is not an investment recommendation, but rather than just spread the money from your divesting from fossil fuels, you want to intentionally reinvest it. Others want to just Another option is to influence the just transition through engaging in current energy organizations and companies to be able to actually have them change their current practices, to be able to create change from within. This can be done through shareholder engagement, proxy voting, advocacy and activism. And Shannon will tell us a little bit more about this. Just move on to the next slide. So in a practical, sort of tactical way, when you're looking at your portfolio, you can start to engage and talk to your portfolio managers and consultants about what kind of negative screens you'd like to have. Many people, many organizations and individuals already have negative screens, the quote unquote sin stocks. But in this process of actually thinking about climate change, there may be added negative screens that you'd like to include. And this is where divestment would occur. Uh, there may be positive screens. So you may want to intentionally invest in low carbon funds, green funds, green bonds. 
You may want to only invest in sustainable businesses, those that are above benchmark in terms of their environmental performance around environmental, social, and governance indicators. You may want to invest directly in climate change solutions. This could be social enterprises, it could be uh, organized, uh, companies on the public stock exchange that are investing in clean tech. This is directly intentionally investing in things that are going to be able to be alternatives to the way we're currently living. And then there's the process of active ownership, shareholder engagement, proxy voting, policy and advocacy. And these, you know, whatever you do, even if you don't move any money, even if you don't change anything about your approach, these are things that everyone can start with. And so Shannon, I'm gonna hand it over to you to talk a little bit about active ownership. Okay, I don't want to spend a whole bunch of time uh, on this, just uh, in, in light of the time, but it's active ownership is really about voting your shares at annual general meetings uh, on issues that come up on the proxy ballot. Uh, you know, many times, uh, a lot of the time, these issues are standard governance items, such as electing boards of directors, but more and more items are emerging um, um, that uh, relate to uh, climate change uh, and, and ESG issues uh, more broadly. And so, for example, at SHARE, we're voting on behalf of our clients uh, on proposals asking for greater transparency from companies uh, on their carbon exposure or voting in favor of pay packages that include incentives. Um, right. Engagement uh, is really about, uh, you know, bringing those issues forward to companies. So talking to companies, uh, particularly uh, in relation to climate change, not only on the supply side, but also on the demand side, right? So we know that we have to transition energy demand uh, and we have energy demand across our portfolios. So there's, so there's lots of opportunities there. Uh, and then finally, just the policy advocacy is really, uh, you know, talking to regulators and, and pushing for uh, clearer and better, uh, not only climate policy, um, but also, uh, broadly speaking, uh, in, in terms of securities markets and capital markets um, regulations, um, that makes sense and can help uh, also facilitate the climate transition. So I don't want to go into any more detail uh, about that. We can certainly talk about it in the questions. Uh, and I think some of our speakers will be raising some of these issues uh, later in the webinar. Great, thank you. So the next slide just shows a few resources and I understand that we're going to be uh, sharing this presentation with you and so I would encourage people to sort of search around and see what kind of um, activities are actually right for you and for your organization. Climate action, there's over uh, 300 investors and 33 trillion dollars worth of, of assets that are actually committed to that in terms of pressuring large corporations. Um, divest, invest, there's eight trillion there, 2,000 organizations committed to pledging that. Global Investment Coalition, all kinds of renewal funds and green chip are sort of, potent, these are sort of examples of the kind of um, investments that are available for you and your organization to actually invest in. But I think we want to get on to our speakers quickly. And so I'm going to actually leave it there and you can actually, you can take some time in your own time to explore these different resources. Great. So now, um, uh, thank you. so now we're going to, I, I'd like, I'm very happy uh, to be able to introduce uh, the story sharing, storytelling portion of the webinar. Um, and Shannon is going to briefly introduce our speakers. Great, thank you, Andrea. We're really happy to have with us today um, three fabulous speakers. Um, we have Rebecca Hertz, who is the Executive Director of the Claycott Biosphere Trust. We have Mark Gauthier, who is the Corporate Treasurer and Investment Officer uh, of Concordia University, and Joy Williams, who is the Senior Advisor of Mantle 314. Um, I will actually 
ask each of the speakers just to give a bit more background uh, uh, on their their role and, and the work that they've done. And we'll actually uh, start with uh, Rebecca. So Rebecca, can you just briefly tell us, introduce yourself and tell us about uh, the work uh, of Clayquat Biosphere Trust uh, in terms of the investment side and, and uh, leading from there really what led um, the Biosphere Trust towards fossil free investing? Yeah, for sure. Thanks for the opportunity to share our story. Um, so we are the Quackle Biosphere Trust is uh, the organization that's responsible for the UNESCO Biosphere designation in Clackwood Sound, and we're also the community foundation for the region. So we really hold the vision of working together to thrive in healthy places. Uh, we manage a $18 million endowment fund to support our own research and programs, as well as granting to other local organizations and then six other funds that are part of our community foundation pool uh, over the last, that's grown over the last few years. Um, so the, really the UNESCO designation, it gives global recognition to our community and our regional commitment to live sustainably. And so, uh, you know, it's, it's really intuitive, I think, that we would be interested in, uh, you know, moving as quickly as we can to uh, respond to the climate crisis through our investments as well as through our programs and our research. Uh, so it's really, it's, it's part of our, I'd say our whole, our holistic um, sort of model of giving and how we incorporate um, the, the investments so that we're ensuring that our returns are not generated by activities that contribute to the issues we're working to resolve mm -hmm. locally. Um, so we were started with a, a gift from the federal government, really an initial endowment, and that came with a uh, SRI mandate. And so we began there in 2000 and really used that best in sector ESG approach that was uh, available at the time um, to ensure that we were investing in all of the industries, but we we're cutting out those low performers from each of the sectors. And at the board table, this just was never good enough. It really was uh, always a conversation around what we can add, uh, you know, looking at the SIN stocks, looking at uh, other, other screen, screens and activities that they want, the board wanted uh, removed from our portfolio. And luckily, we've been working with Genes Capital Management always since 2000. They've been really responsive to this. And in 2012, we're um, you know, able to move from this best in sector approach to divesting. So, um, you know, they, they're not wanting to be financing climate change. It's consistent with our values and our vision. And we're really appreciative of their capacity to uh, allow us to go in that direction. And can you tell us a little bit more uh, about uh, some of the responsible investment strategies that you have put in place with Jenna? So talk a little bit about um, further about sort of the process of reducing exposure and then, you know, divesting. And then uh, also on the other side in terms of uh, the shareholder action piece that that Jenna brings. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate that you've got all those those bullets up on the slide because really that is it is the work of Genesis Capital Management, and uh, we're so thankful that they're you know they're responsive, that they're forward thinking, you know, with these different opportunities that they're pursuing, and we're just encouraging them on as a you know small community foundation on the far mm -hmm. west coast. So um, their their fossil fuel free funds are uh, do contain zero fossil fuel reserves, and so that's eliminated the, the risks of stranded assets that have already been spoken about today. Uh, and then they're really, their equity funds are committed to carbon emission intensity that's 70% lower than the market. So um, we'll see that as you know, very in line with what you're already talking about. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then the engagement piece, um, you know, they have many examples that they're sharing with us. They're engaging with Loblaw, for example, um, around electricity and asking them to set ambitious GHG reduction targets and look, talking to the banks about how they're transitioning their energy lending portfolios and looking for higher lending towards clean energy businesses and projects. So um, I think that's it's both on the reduced exposure side and then those examples of shareholder action on our behalf. That's excellent. Um, thank you, Rebecca. I think, um, you know, thinking about the audience and, and other foundations um, who are on the call, who may be, you know, a small foundation, just like uh, 
the Clockwork Biosphere Trust. Um, if you had sort of one piece of advice um, for those groups on the call who uh, may be just getting started, what, what would that be? Yeah, I love that question. Um, I think it really is, is, it, is this a good fit with your stage of development and with your values uh, as an organization? Because for us, it was really, it's, an, it's a no-brainer in terms of the values, but it did take those, um, you know, that initial maturity as an organization around once we had received those funds and really looking at our governance and understanding how we could use a philanthropic model at all of these different levels to be able to um, action around climate. Um, so, you know, there's lots of challenges at the board level before we think we're mature enough to be able to uh, look at the values and see the alignment at all levels. And for me as a staff person, it's really, um, it's been an easy one because it's the expertise of Genis that lets us do this work. And it's a nice generative conversation at the board table uh, that is, you know, it's forward moving, it's aspirational, it's really, it's values aligned, but it's not actually a lot of work for me to do as a staff person in the middle because I'm not an investment professional. So um, it's not adding a lot of work to my band load. It's really my, my workload. So things to think about for others. Yeah, no, that's great. That is definitely um, a balancing act. Um, so thank you, Rebecca. I'm sure that we might come back with some more questions uh, for you in the Q&A. Um, but I'd just like to turn over now uh, to uh, back to Andrea, who is going to have a chat with Marc Gauthier from uh, Concordia. Thank you. Um, and, and thank you, Marc, for, for joining us today. Uh, and Concordia University Foundation is one of the first universities in Canada to commit to implementing responsible and impact investing approaches across all of their asset classes. And Mark, I'm hoping that you can start by telling us a little bit about your role and then share your experience in this journey of, of actually implementing this approach. Yes, thank you for inviting me. Uh, yes, I'm so part of my role as corporate treasurer and CIO, so not only do I oversee uh, financial investment, both uh, pension and foundation, but as well, uh, all of the capital investments and financing program at the university and corporate risk uh, uh, management of the university as well. So it allows me to be, have a very integrative approach uh, to uh, towards sustainability. And so how this journey began, it really, the university uh, about uh, four years ago uh, developed and got approved a new sustainability policy for its overall uh, university. And uh, so uh, we made sure that it was not only limited to operational of the university, but as well as its academic and uh, research uh, program, but including uh, on my end, both uh, capital investment and financing and as well as investment. So in that context, at the same time, uh, Concordia the Foundation was uh, used. It's a young foundation, but it was a uh, its change of vo its vocation over time when it became really the investment arm. University had multiple investment needs, so we had to change the investment structure. And so the combination of relooking at the complete structure of the foundation, as well as university developing a sustainability policy, it allows it a possibility now to integrate both and really evolving the foundation, uh, not only from a, an investment need, but as well as uh, a sustainable need that uh, led to uh, many actions that way we led. Thank you, Mark. So my understanding is that, so you integrated, the first step was to actually create an integrated, you know, integrated sustainability policy that spanned all of your operations. Is that correct? And then you correct. started, right. Yes. And then and then with that, almost sort of implementing it and setting a benchmark, then I understand you started to work contributing to solutions, looking forward long-term view perspective with a focus on innovation. And so this was actually the intentional positive screens and actually is this a 5% portion of your portfolio that you look to actually invest in impact? Yeah, so, so there's a few actions we did. And uh, so uh, one of which is uh, we also, uh, in light of, uh, so we receive requests uh, from uh, a specific student body to divest. And as part of the sustainable uh, policy development and an action plan, there's also 
were integrated uh, with, with professors. All this led to a, a dialogue. Uh, so we want to make sure we had a dialogue and all this with our stakeholders. So we created a joint advisory committee to, to get that dialogue going. That's, what, that's the first step. And provided some education as to how, where we wanted to go and, and, and why we wanted to go that route. And to your point exactly, the focus was looking forward and really with a focus on innovation because this is where we feel that the greatest impact we can have towards our global sustainable goals is towards innovation. So the focus is really on contribution towards solution. So with this in mind, uh, so part of the action is one first, we, as I mentioned, we created this joint advisory committee just to get that dialogue and education going. Uh, thereafter, we became uh, UNPRI signatories. And as part of the new revamp structure of the foundation, we also created a new investment policy to which we integrated both a responsible, impact, in, a responsible investment policy and an impact investment policy. And uh, to, to that end, as more specifically for the impact investment policy, now that the foundation had a multiple pool structure, meaning we had a uh, for our various investment needs and programs, we had a long-term, short-term, and middle-term pool. Uh, that specifically for a long-term pool because that's what impact investment is about. It's a long-term approach. Uh, we dedicated uh, a target of five percent, but a range of zero to ten as a beginning, uh, as part of our overall asset allocation of a long-term pool. So that was a uh, part of the. Uh, an allocation that, that uh, part of the new revamp investment policy uh, that uh, that began that, that that was fully implemented uh, in approved uh, sorry last year in 2018 and uh, I have already allocated and got approved uh, half of our allocation now towards impact investments uh, within the first year so it's great progress great momentum and at the same time um, university this is on the on my uh, treasurer's side, um, I went to the financial market to raise uh, about 75 million of uh, long-term deb debentures in the market, and uh, 25 of which was a sustainable bond. And uh, we hired the, the firm of Visual Eris to make sure that we were sort of uh, sort of admissible to all uh, to towards this, and they 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 analyzed us as being a top rank in terms of their criteria. And we became, as per their uh, knowledge, uh, we became the first uh, university in the world to issue a sustainable bond. So the integration between capital investment, financing, and investment has, both, has fully be begun towards uh, sustainable investment. Uh, that's, a, that's amazing, Mark. It, what, a, what a journey. And I, I think it's really interesting that um, Concordia actually, I imagine you're under quite a bit of pressure from your students to actually divest from fossil fuel, but you actually chose to go another route. Um, do you want to do you want to share a little bit about the conversation and, and the process of deciding deciding that? Yes, correct. So we the uh, it we wanted to evolve from getting requests uh, uh, to to divest to having a, a uh, a level of dialogue uh, and especially we focus on education and understanding as to where we wanted to go and why and more specifically there's three reasons why we we chose the route of of where we did uh one we we had to make sure they understood the, the student body as well as uh, uh, the academic side uh, understood that the foundation is not a mission-based uh foundation it is a liability return-based one, meaning that we have financial commitments to uh, uh, to integrate into our conceptualization of investment policy. So in this context, a portfolio uh, construction approach must take into account an optimal level of mix of return and risk. And a divestment approach simply is not aligned to this type of framework as it increases the level of, of concentration of risk. Uh, so that's one element that didn't align. The second one is the board itself are concerned as to the scope of divestment. Where does it can, can eventually lead? Uh, it can be from decarbonization to even greater amount of topics. And then that creates a, a whole, a lot more certainties on how to build a uh, an investment policy that's around a, a liability base uh, structure. Uh, so that's the second uh, uh, point that led to our approach. But the third one is the one I mentioned before, the more important one. We really wanted to take a forward-looking approach. 
really a contribution to solution approach uh, where innovation is is key and uh, and because this is where we believe that's the greatest impact it can have in meeting our global sustainable goals. Great, thank you, Mark. I'm sure there. I want to make sure that we leave a little bit of time for questions at the end, and so. Um, I think I'm going to hand it back to, and I know that people will have questions for you, so I'm going to hand it back to Shannon to introduce uh, Joy Williams to talk a little bit about her journey at Mantle 314. Great. Thank you, uh, Andrea. Um, I'm really excited um, to have Joy Williams join us today. Um, Joy is a senior advisor uh, at Mantle 314, and I'll uh, actually start out just by asking Joy, can you tell us a bit about your background? Because you have quite a diverse background uh, and, and skill set, and have done some extremely uh, interesting work recently um, uh, with the New York State Common Retirement Fund. So, can you just uh, introduce a little bit about your background, uh, and, and we'll go from there. Sure. Um, and thanks for inviting me to be part of this. It's really great to see that this topic is becoming um, really something that is of interest across the financial space. Um, my background has generally been in, um, um, in finance for the past 10 or 10 plus years, everything from venture cap and private equity to the larger asset owners. And that's part of the work um, that I do at Mantle. We're, we're a multidisciplinary team and we were just actually talking the other day, we believe we're the largest climate change focus team in Canada. We're now up to 11 people um, and my particular area of expertise is that intersection of climate and finance. In, in uh, specific to this conversation today, um, I just finished chairing the decarbonization advisory panel for the New York State Common Retirement Fund. And that's um, really hard to say fast, I have to <laughs> say. Um, but it was, I think it was a very groundbreaking piece of work um, that they asked us to do. And that fund in particular being one of the, the largest in the US, I think has the potential to really lead in this space. Great, well, I agree. I highly recommend uh, everybody to read the uh, decarbonizing uh, report that came out uh, from the advisory panel. Um, and, and just to say um, that the, the New York State Common Retirement Fund, I believe in terms of asset size is 209 billion. Uh, so, so quite large, um, but can you brief us, briefly tell us just more about the process, um, what the panel's purpose was and some, what some of the recommendations were? So what, what, what was the mandate you were given? Uh, what was the process that you went through with the panel? Uh, and what were some of the recommendations that came out of that? Yeah, that's a great question because the name of the panel itself, Decarbonization Advisory Panel, and also the context with which this was really put together, which is there is a large divestment movement in New York State. So there was some assumptions before we started that it would be about how do you divest. In actual fact, we wanted to make sure that the charge we were given um, was broad. And you can see it on this slide here that this is really across the board. How does a fund this large um, manage in risks and opportunities, specifically in light of the transition. So um, the six of us who sat on the panel were really, really glad to get such a broad charge because we felt this was, this was the right question. If you're a fund who needs to prepare for what's coming, um, divestment is just far too narrow of a question and um, there's lots of other complications with that. Um, whereas climate change goes across the entire portfolio and to really look at how um, a fund might be affected, you need to, to look at the whole question, in other words. Um, and for those of you who don't know, the Common Retirement Fund is a sole trustee model. So we advise the controller, the trustee, not the investment teams, and then he can give direction to the investment teams. But I have to say, all of the investment teams were very engaged throughout this process. Um, this is not a new topic to the fund. So a lot of the groundwork was done for us. And over the course of a year, we met several times with everyone and were able to hear what their concerns were, what their challenges were, and really um, hone in on advice that would be particularly useful to them. Um, so did you want me to just jump into the recommendations? Yeah, that would be great. Okay, sure. So there's three parts to the report for those of you who get a chance to uh, download it and read it, it's public. 
and they're the beliefs, the key recommendations, and the supporting recommendations. I think if you go to the next slide, um, there's a reason we set out the, the, the main part of the report is only about 15 pages. And the reason that we spent, um, I think, three or four pages, so at least a fifth of the report on the beliefs, is that it was really important to convey the business case for what we set up in terms of the key ambition. And the one belief that I would pick out is this one that I, I put on the slide. And I think, Shannon, you mentioned this earlier, that you know, climate's really on the macro scale. It's not a single risk factor. And if you have the mindset that it's something that will fundamentally disrupt economies, then you start to look at it differently within your investment strategy. And the conversations you have with managers um, and beneficiaries become quite different. Also, that sets up the key ambition, because if climate change is this phenomena across economies um, and geographies, then you do have to look at the entire portfolio. And this is where the panel got ambitious, where we said the entire portfolio should be made consistent with the two degree or lower future. And that is a pretty scary statement to most investors. Um, certainly um, not just the fund, but I've spoken to many others since this is public and that, that's just like, if that's a gut reaction by many investors, it's like, how can you possibly do this? And really the proof is in the details. We define this as not only assets that might be climate solutions, in fact, we had a whole recommendation about climate solutions, but to also be smart about this, that there, there may be several things in your portfolio that are neutral to climate, or at least climate is quite far down on that list of priorities um, for, for particular investments. And that's, that's okay. The other thing that we set up and tried to recognize is that none of this happens overnight. Certainly nobody pivots an entire portfolio um, that quickly. It's gonna be a journey. And the tools which, which make up the bulk of the recommendations start to lay out things that are very flexible in terms of um, where they can be applied, to whom they can be applied, how they change, and how they can take into account um, new information as, as we move along the, uh, the pathway of transition, for example. Um, yeah, so there's a lot to unpack in the 15 pages. Yeah, no, it um, certainly uh, is a lot of really valuable information to fit in. And so I want to ask you sort of uh, one uh, additional question, a bit of a, um, a quick response, if you can. Uh, what is the one thing that investors are doing today that is exposing them to climate risk um, based on the work that you're doing broadly? with Mantle, but also based on the work that, that you did with the advisory panel. Right, um, so I think the one thing that they're doing today is that they're investing as if it's business as usual, and they don't realize that they're not pricing the risk associated with that. So really quick, what I mean by that is, if you continue to invest and follow the market, that presupposes that you're assuming that we will head towards, there's no transition, there's no physical risk. So we're headed towards like a four, five, six degree world. But we actually know quite a bit about the physical impacts in those types of scenarios. So if you would apply what we know about those scenarios to um, you know, your discount rate or how you quantify risk for those particular assets, you would get a whole different risk profile. But we're not investing that way. So I think it's just the fact that we're not asking these questions um, and not fully pricing in that risk is, is the biggest exposure. And that's across your portfolio. That's not in um, you know, just one sector. It's, uh, it's across your entire portfolio. Thank you. And I think that leads nicely into my last question for you, uh, Joy, which is, um, you know, the participants on this call are, are smaller than the, the, the $209 billion New York State Common Retirement Fund. Um, as our first speaker, Rachel, uh, or Rebecca indicated, um, you know, they tend to rely on expertise from investment managers and other service providers. So just interested to look at, in your opinion, what does, uh, 
what do tangible steps look like for smaller investors like like foundations what does bold ambition look like uh in your opinion uh for smaller investors yeah no that's a great question um so bold ambition i think for any size investor is to make climate change a board or a trustee level priority so if you take the word climate out of it and you just say hey there's this issue that has the potential to disrupt our entire portfolio and change the makeup of the the market then wouldn't the board want to talk about that or your executive team your your cio your ceo if you take that word climate out of it that that test probably holds true for a lot of people the word climate does tend to um perhaps evoke a particular mindset so you know easy first steps um that we put into or not necessarily easy but quick wins that we put into the recommendation one is around education and we actually thought that there's a lot more education needed both internally and externally for various different reasons because climate is not a topic that's taught anywhere in finance or in uh in directors um, and the the other really easy first quick win I think it's to make use of the relationships um, that you already have, which I think Andrea mentioned with managers, with consultants, so those relationships exist. So just get the conversation started. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much, Joy. Um, we are going to move uh, into questions. Uh, we have a few minutes um, and a number of questions that have come through. Um, um, uh, one of the questions is how to get uh, the conversation started with asset managers. Um, I'm going to say, uh, I think as a follow-up to this webinar, we'll be producing a little bit of guidance exactly on that um, to, to help uh, you have a set of questions and, and uh, also different ways that you might evaluate uh, managers uh, on their performance. Um, one question that we had through um, that I will direct to um, perhaps Joy and uh, Andrea um, is, can you provide an example of how to phase in a decarbonized portfolio approach while keeping liquidity, uh, income generation, uh, et cetera? So actually that might go to uh, also to Mark. Um, Joy, do you have any comments on that question? Um, I'll keep it brief. Um, the, the comment I would have is any of these, the way we define decarbonization, which was not uh, blind divestment, um, would be like any other investment decision, that you have to always look at all of these things together and you have to do it uh, prudently with an investment plan behind you. So it's not, going decarbonized is not synony synonymous with sacrificing liquidity or income generation. Okay, uh, thank you. Mark, do you have any uh, responses or comments to that question? I can repeat the question if you need. No, no, I'm good. Uh, it, phase in decarbonization, uh, first I think it, it, that in itself needs to be defined as to what it, it means in terms of uh, uh, putting together an investment policy. And I think that's one of the biggest element. But certainly for me in my case, uh, what this evolves to is first of all, because uh, this is relatively young, we're into first year uh, of all of this. And so the next step for me is to really develop the measuring and the analytic, analytics aspect of all of our portfolio that just been recently implemented. And from there, it's a, then we can see how it leads to the portfolio approach to measuring and integrating not only the, the sectors as to where we want to innovate to, and how it evolves to the teams, how it links to all sustainable, uh, sustainable global goals, and then how it leads to uh, returns. So to me, it's it's an integrated approach and in taking account not only decarbonization, but as well all, all sustainable goals. Excellent, thanks, Mark. Andrea, do you have anything to add there around the, the challenges related to liquidity and income generation? Yeah, sure, thanks, Jan. Just very briefly, you know, I think that the amount of liquidity and income that you need in your portfolio are static. You know, that these are these are clear pieces that you have to hit. And within those parameters, within that sandbox, you can then evaluate all of your investments based on how they are performing from a carbon perspective. And so it goes into, as as both Joy and Mark have suggested, it goes in holistically and 
incorporated into the investment approach. And with each investment decisions, decision, you choose how it's going to affect you in terms of your target of lowering your carbon. This is how we did it at Inspirit when I was there, and it's how we see many of our clients uh, at Rally are incorporating this process into their approach. Excellent, thank you, Andrea. So uh, I'm cognizant of time. Uh, as I said, there was a question about working effectively with managers, and that will be uh, a resource that we will be developing um, uh, following up on this call to help folks uh, have some meaningful conversations with their service providers uh, on climate change. And so uh, I do want to uh, just move along uh, in terms of what we have um, coming up. Um, uh, with the Foundation Investing 2.0 initiative. Um, Andrea, you were going to talk uh, a bit about our upcoming webinar and other events. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Shannon. So what we're hoping from this webinar is that you'll think a little bit about what you might do in the next couple of days, couple of weeks, couple of months. And I want to let you know what we are going to do. Shannon's going to be sharing the, the recording. We're going to be sending you a, a survey to get some feedback. And then on June 25th, we have our next webinar in the series, which is Advancing Reconciliation and Growing the Indigenous Economy, a Role for Investors. And so in this webinar, we're going to explore how investors can have a positive, uh, positive um, impact on uh, actually moving us as a country and as a society towards greater reconciliation. Um, in addition to that, we have a masterclass that we'll be, we'll be holding at the Community Foundations of Canada All-In Conference that will be happening next week in Victoria. Great, thank you, Andrea. So uh, I will also commit to sending the paper, uh, the decarbonizing, uh, decarbonization advisory panel uh, recommendations that Joy spoke of. Um, I invite anyone uh, who uh, has uh, follow-up questions to please get in touch uh, with us. We're happy to uh, engage with those. And I also just want to draw attention to two in-person events that we are going to be running uh, in Vancouver on November 14th and in Toronto on November 19th. Uh, that's looking at uh, really from intent to action uh, and how uh, foundations can establish sort of the governance frameworks to really be looking at uh, issues like climate change across their portfolio. And we'll be bringing uh, in experts uh, to to work with with you uh, on those conversations um, and we also have uh, a webinar uh, coming up in October and that's going to be looking uh, following up really in many ways from this conversation on a just transition so I want to thank everyone for your participation we will be in touch uh, with the recording of the webinar uh, as well as a short survey to, to help us improve and uh, and make sure that these webinars are really um, providing value to you so Thank you to everyone. Thank you to uh, all, all of our supporters uh, and, and to our speakers today who took time to really provide their experience and expertise. Uh, that was hugely valuable. So uh, thank you, Rebecca, Mark, uh, and Joy for that. Thanks so much. And I guess we're done. Yeah, great. Wonderful. Thank you, Shannon. <laughs>